Dave Scott, he's a member of the Veterans Committee, will introduce our guest speaker. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, before I start my remarks, uh, we do expect to have some guests show up in the next seven to six or seven minutes. And these guests will be a little bit higher up in the air than we are right now. And they're gonna be moving very fast. But I wanna thank some members of our committee and Misty Clark for her tireless work in arranging this. So stay tuned. As vice chair of this, of the Loveland Veterans Committee, I have the honor of introducing our speaker this morning, Sergeant Dave Corlett of the Cincinnati Police Department. Besides being a 31 year veteran of CPD, he is the founder of the military liaison group within the department and an instructor with the Hamilton County mental health crisis teams. This program has been recognized by the Department of Justice for innovative law enforcement and community partnerships with our military veterans and personnel. Prior to joining Cincinnati Police Department in 1992, he served in the Army with Alpha Company 1st Battalion, 24th Aviation Regiment in Iraq during operations Desert Storm and Desert Shield. Sergeant Corlett has instructed for the National Association of Attorney Generals, the Attorney General's Conference, the Ohio Crime Prevention Association Conference, Hamilton County Crisis Intervention Teams, and the Cincinnati Police Department Police Academy. Ladies and gentlemen, I present to you uh, Sergeant Dave Corlett. Good morning, everybody. I want to start by saying I, I am not even close to that important. Um, sometimes when I look back at the things that I've done and, and when somebody reads them to me, I can't believe that that's been my history. Public speaking is not something I ever believed that I would be doing. If you had told me 10 years ago I'd be standing in front of audiences talking, I, I wouldn't believe it. And, and to this day, my wife still doesn't believe people ask me to come talk. I, I often have to send her pictures to prove that I don't have girlfriends all over the country. Um, I, I want to take this opportunity I, to tell you that I, I'm not a public speaker. I'm a veteran, I'm a soldier, um, I'm a retired policeman, retired sergeant, um, but I have, I have a message. And typically when people ask me to do these type of events, my, my first inclination is saying, no, that's, that's not what I do. That's not my place. I, I teach. I can present a PowerPoint. I can give you information. I can show you things, through, tell you things through story that you may remember. Um, but public speaking is just a whole other world that I don't do. Um, but for some reason, God keeps telling me to say yes, and then within 24 hours, he tells me exactly what to say. Um, so here we are. And today, today is Memorial Day, and it, it's not about me. So I, I, I want to stop right there, and you know, anybody who wants to know anything about me can, can look it up. That's not what we're here to talk about. Um, they told me they wanted me to talk for about five minutes, and I said, well, then you got the wrong guy. Uh, I can barely get through my introduction in five minutes. But today, the first thing that, that I ask myself is, what does it mean to be a veteran? Uh, what does it mean to be a, a, a former service member? I saw all the people that self-identified in the audience. I, I, I see our color guard, and I know that every one of us has something in common. And it's that we share loss. We share loss. Everybody in this audience who identified themselves as a veteran has a particular person or a particular group of people that they think about this weekend. They think about them other times, too but they think about them particularly this weekend. And for those of you who don't have someone in particular that you think about, I'm gonna provide you a few, okay? Um, and, and we're gonna start with, in August, on August 2nd of 1990, um, Saddam Hussein and his forces invaded Kuwait. Um, a lot of us remember that. There are some here that would not remember that, young people. Um, I was part of the 24th Infantry Division, we're the Rapid Deployment Desert Division for the United States Army's 18th Airborne Corps, so we knew at some point we were going to go to the desert. Um, I, was in, I was stationed there with two of my best friends, Mike Daniels, Chris Anderson. Uh, we all graduated flight school together and we had gone on to, to be at Hunter Army Airfield in Savannah. August 2nd was the invasion, August 13th we were put on alert. August 12th, my best friend Michael Daniels was on his honeymoon in the Bahamas. 
Um, we were we were young people without a lot of money, so that was a big big honeymoon. We're gonna pause. sent a black hawk to the Bahamas to retrieve my friend Mike. Brought him and his wife back from day two of their honeymoon, locked us down on post, and they didn't get to spend the rest of their honeymoon together. We deployed to Iraq. We spent six or seven months in the desert training. Um, on February 20th of 1991, we were given our first nighttime mission into Iraq. We were the Army's first attack helicopter battalion that utilized Apaches, and they wanted to use us. Our job was to fly deep into Iraq at night without being seen and film everything we saw. Film every tank emplacement, film every air defense artillery battery, and mark them on the maps with the GPS so that when the Air Force crossed the border and started dropping bombs, those were the first places they went. When the tank commanders crossed the line, they knew where, where the enemy was. February 20th was our first nighttime mission. We planned, we planned, we planned. We had plans for everything. One of those plans was what we do in case we hit weather because we were flying at night with night vision goggles. No light, no sound, no radio chatter, noise and light discipline. Um, about 100 miles into Iraq, we hit a sandstorm and they come out of nowhere. They're not on the map, they're not predicted by the weather, they're just there. And we, knew, we all knew what to do. My particular aircraft, I was to climb from 20 feet off the deck to 50 feet off the deck. I was to turn to zero, nine, zero degrees, fly for two minutes, turn south, go back and everybody had their individual instruction. There were about 15 aircraft on this mission. Everybody went to a different altitude, a different direction, and we would all meet back at, at the refuel rearm site. We got back to that refuel rearm site and we were missing an aircraft. Uh, my best friend, Michael Daniels, and his, and, and his partner, Hal Hooper Reichel, did not make it back. They flew into a sand dune and were killed on that mission. Um, I'm not sure why it was him and not me. Some of us have gone through that survivor's guilt, but he didn't make it back. And that's, that's one that I would hope on, on Memorial Day 2023 and future Memorial Days that some of you remember. Uh, 2012, a young man named Jonathan Watson was deployed to Afghanistan, served his tour in Afghanistan, and he came home with some struggles. He had some serious struggles. Uh, he, he didn't know how to, to, to reintegrate to society. Um, I was the military program director for the Cincinnati Police Department. I, I helped struggling vets, and to this day, that's, that's what I do, even though I'm retired. Um, John Watson, one night, uh, went to Lower Price Hill to his place of employment, and he barricaded inside, himself inside the building with several firearms and was going to commit suicide. At the very last minute, he called 911, which sent the Cincinnati Police Department down there, and they spent the next two hours surrounding the building and negotiating with him um, with a hostage negotiator. And, and the, the negotiator was then not able to be successful with him. And after about two hours, suddenly remembered that I existed. Called me in the middle of the night, I drove down there. He told me to get on the phone with John. And I said, whoa, I'm not a negotiator. I'm gonna say the wrong thing and make it worse. Um, he said, no, no, you need to get on the phone with this guy. Literally three minutes later, John walked out the front door and surrendered to me and I took him up to the VA hospital. Um, I met him the next day at the VA hospital. We talked about his issues. Um, we, we actually stayed in touch. We became friends. This occurred in 2017. 2017. We became friends. John was involved in the Veterans Treatment Court in Warren County. He was a su successful graduate of the program um, and actually became a peer mentor in the court system. The Ohio Attorney General asked me to be a presenter at their national conference in Philadelphia this year, and they asked me in January. And the AG said, hey, Dave, remember that kid you, you told me the story about uh, that, you know, that barricaded himself? And he said, what if you bring him along and, and interview him on stage? I said, he would love that. He has always asked me to be part of what I do and to be able to speak to other audiences and pass the message of what we do. I said, he will be so excited. But I was sick when I received that phone call. I had bronchitis. I could barely speak. I decided to wait three or four days until I felt better to call John and tell him about this opportunity because I knew how excited he would be. He had just called me and, and asked me to go to dinner, you know, because we had maintained friendship over the years. Um, on Saturday morning, uh, I woke up at about 9 a.m. to some text messages that came in at 4 a.m. 
And the first one was, are you awake? Well, I was not. The second one was, the cops are here, I don't know why. And the third one was, I'm spiraling and I don't know what to do. Um, at 9 a.m. Mm -hmm. I texted him, John, I don't know what's going on, call me immediately. Call me immediately. At 9.30 I got a phone call from the Warren County Sheriff's Department that he had taken his life. Um, John was not able to come out of those struggles completely and I was not available to him at that time. I, I know I can't be there for everybody, but that's another veteran who's lost his life to the traumas he experienced in combat. And, and I, I want on this Memorial Day and future Memorial Days that we remember him as well. The third and final veteran I'm gonna tell you about today. Um, in 1992, I started the Cincinnati Police Academy. I, I was so lucky, you know, veterans come, there were so many veterans getting out of the military. I was so lucky to be a Cincinnati policeman. I worked so hard to get into that academy. And the guy sitting next to me was an 82nd Airborne, Desert Shield, Desert Storm veteran, just like me. And we became instantly best friends. Um, his name was Thomas Edward Haas. And we were, the, we were the best of friends all the way through the academy. They wanted to throw us out of class half the time because we were telling jokes or telling more stories or not paying attention to our search and seizure classes. Um, I look in the audience, I see John Arnold, one of my, one of my favorite prosecutors. John can tell you stories about cases with Tommy Haas and I when we were in our 20s. Um, we were the best of friends. We spent the first seven years of our career together. We were partners in a car for six and a half years. I, I believe the two of us got each other through our own post-traumatic stress tr struggles. Um, we were each other's support network. A few years into our career, we both got a letter from the Pentagon saying that we had been exposed to sarin nerve agent during our deployment to Iraq. Uh, we had been part of the burn pit teams. We were we were exposed to every nasty thing the Middle East had to offer. Um, and I remember the letter said, although we don't know the long-term effects of a sarin nerve agent exposure, um, please submit to your nearest VA hospital for testing so we can track you. Um, neither one of us did. Neither one of us did. We're young. You know, we didn't want to know, we didn't want to know if bad things were going to happen. Um, in 2020, my partner, my best friend, Tom Haas, was diagnosed with brain cancer. Um, his journey ended in January of 2022. I ask that on this Memorial Day and future Memorial Days, you remember my partner, Tom Haas. That's the meaning of Memorial Day, and I couldn't be more pleased that I was given the opportunity to share those stories with you today. And I couldn't be more pleased that you all stood here and listened to me talk. Thank you very much.